My name is Patty Fort and I manage public programs here at California Historical Society. And I want to welcome you to, to this institution as your home of history. Um, we hope that either it is that for you or it will become that for you. So we're very grateful. Um, a question, a show of hands, uh, who's been here before? Yay, look at all those happy faces who've been here before. Well, we thank you all for returning, and to all those who are here for the first time, um, we welcome you with open arms and, and glad to have you with us tonight. So the California Historical Society, or CHS, was founded in 1871, and today we embrace a mission to make California's rich history a part of your contemporary lives in order to support a more engaged citizenry, and we do that in a number of ways. First is actually our exhibitions, which are sitting amongst one of them right now. It's called Boomtowns, How Photography Shaped Los Angeles and San Francisco, and it's straight from our collections. So every time we do programs here in this space, you're immersed within our exhibition series and our exhibitions in general. And we rotate those every three to six months. This one will close March 10th, and we reopen new exhibitions on California and the railroads at the end of March. Uh, March 21st will be the opening of uh, Overland to California and Mark Rudell's Westward, The Course of Empire. So we hope to see you for those. You can also, you know, after the program, after you've talked to the speakers, gotten some books maybe, um, you can certainly look through the exhibition, but we hope you come back um, for other exhibitions we do as well. And we also support our mission through public programs, which, check that off the box, you've done that right now, you're at one uh, this evening. So, um, uh, like the one you're here for tonight. Uh, we usually do uh, 60 public programs a year, uh, typically you know, evening programs and during the weekends, so uh, definitely come back for those. We have a couple coming up we want to share with you. One is on labor, uh, looking at labor history pre-1950, so about 1849 to 1950 with Chris Carlson and Fred Glass, and that's on Thursday, February 7th. And then we, every Tuesday this um, this February, we have Black History Month programs, ranging from um, looking at African-American cartoon and illustrators for Afro Comic Con, um, as well as looking at our collections through the sense of migration, so looking at black migration, as well as black classical music. So that's every Tuesday evening here at CHS in February. And lastly, we support our collections, uh, support our mission through collections. So around you are our collections, but we have so, so many amazing photographs, manuscripts, ephemera, so many things that you can see online through our digital library, but also through our online catalog. Or you can come back here Wednesday through Friday, um, no appointment necessary, 1 to 5 p.m., and view our collections and do research. So that we want this to be a place that you do research in, and I feel like there's a few people in the audience who already do, but definitely feel free to ask us any questions about that as well. Um, most importantly, our mission is supported by all of you. So everyone who purchased tickets tonight, everyone who are members in the crowd, and we love to see who are our members, so raise your hands who are the members here, wonderful. So you're supporting amazing programs like this, paying for travel, speaking fees, keeping the lights on, all of that. Um, and then you get to come for free to these programs with a guest, which is a great benefit. Um, and we know that you know if you wanna chat with any of the members in the audience, get their voucher of approval, definitely feel free. Um, you get special access to special programs and tours, things like that, and uh, it both saves you a lot of money, but then it saves us you know, it gives us the opportunity to preserve our collections, do programs, do exhibitions, etc. So, um, I want to thank our partner tonight, which is the Chinese Historical Society of, of America, which where Monica. I don't, I don't know where Monica is, but she's an amazing partner. <laughs> Yay! There she is. And I'm going to have her come up and say a little bit about CHSA, and then I'm going to introduce Harvey, and then we're going to start. So, thank you for uh, listening to my script. So, there you go. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Monica Palayo Locke and I am a programs and education coordinator at the Chinese Historical Society and on your uh, <laughs> on your chairs, you got both our brochure and events calendar. As you can tell, we're being really busy this time and one of the highlights uh, to just Note that we will also be partnering with the California Historical Society, um, and we're going to have a symposium in May to celebrate the contributions that Chinese workers did to the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. So please uh, he get in involved and hear us when we have uh, more information about that. But the Chinese Historical Society itself is the oldest um, organization dedicated to the interpretation, preservation, and promotion of Chinese history in the United. States and we are in itself 
um, in one of the oldest Chinatowns in the country. So we welcome everybody to come in. I saw a couple of our members um, here as well, so it's wonderful to have that kind of synergy in this event. Um, and in the same way that we are here with you, we welcome you to come to our organization. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you, Monica. So I'm here to introduce Harvey, who will introduce the speakers this evening. Making this program has been so wonderful. Working with such competent, artistic, creative, dynamic people has been such a pleasure. Every time I talk about this program, staff are like, you really care about this? And I was like, I do. I care about sharing this history. I care about these speakers. And I care that we're doing this both here and in Los Angeles. So March 7th, actually, Judy and Eddie will join us on a panel at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes on March 7th um, with the Chinese American Museum. So it's been such a pleasure to build programming across the, the, country, uh, across the state um, about this topic and, and learn new things from panel to panel. So it's been really an honor. And, and Harvey is somebody that I chatted with during uh, the planning of the state strike program. He had a, a huge role to play in the, in the state uh, strike 50 years ago. Um, but he also, UC Berkeley is 1969. So sorry. Uh, I got my strikes mixed up. That happens occasionally. Do not lance me for that. Um, but I also understand that that's it's sort of a boo-boo, so I apologize. Um, and I'm here to introduce Harvey, who I have enjoyed working with so much and has really wrangled this program together. It's, it's a significant thing to talk about visual culture, the history of these two Chinatowns, all in one program. So really, it's been a thoughtful and compassionate process. So I thank Harvey and everyone for participating in that. So Harvey's been interested in research and writing about the evolution of Asian American and third world social justice movements on campus and in the communities. He's also involved in the I Hotel History Committee to write a timeline of the history of struggle. He teaches Asian American studies at UC Berkeley and was awarded the 2016 American Cultures Ronald Takaki Teaching Award. He uses his community work experience to bring his life, uh, to bring life to his Asian American history, Chinese American history and contemporary issues um, course. Many of his students have gone to work in social justice causes. Um, and so we just want to thank Harvey. We want to thank his wonderful uh, student who's here helping us keep time and to all of you tonight. And I'm going to leave it to you because I should not say anymore. So I'm going to hand it to Harvey. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Beth. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I was taking the BART over here because I live in the East Bay. Actually, I used to live in San Francisco uh, near the North Beach area and then later. Uh, <clears throat> near Silver Avenue, and uh, two of my kids were actually born in SF, okay. Um, so I'm kind of like a SF resident today. <laughs> uh, on the BART, I, I, was, I had some time to kill, and I was just thinking of this 50th anniversary of the Third World Liberation Front strike that established uh, ethnic studies at SF State and UC Berkeley, you know, it, it, it was a struggle, you know, it's, it's because they didn't want us to have these programs, you know, the institutions didn't want us to know our own history and that definitely hurt uh, Asian American students, but also hurt Americans as a whole in terms of not knowing the, the, the true history of America, okay. So that was like, so then I was thinking that uh, we have about approximately 170 years of Chinese American history, and if the Thorough Liberation Front strike uh, took place 50 years ago, so you just imagine, uh, previous to that, uh, how Asian American and Chinese American history was studied. You know, it was it was a long period of neglect. Okay, and um, I'm really glad to uh, <coughs> introduce the panelists today uh, because of the fact that uh, they've taken that struggle further, you know, in terms of deepening our understanding of history, the complexities of uh, Chinese American history, and they all have something to contribute, okay? So we, we only have an hour, okay? So that's why we have a timekeeper, uh, Richard uh, over there <laughs> is one of my students. <laughs> And I, I saw him sitting way in the back, so I said, hey, remember we had to do this for our student presentations? Okay, so let's do it today. <laughs> okay, so in terms of the uh, uh, panelists today, uh, William Gao is a 
SF-based community historian and educator, currently a lecturer of American studies at Stanford. Okay. Uh, he completed his PhD in ethnic studies at UC Berkeley in 2018, okay, just last year. A proud graduate of SF Public Schools, uh, William double majored in cinema studies and history at New NYU before receiving his master's degree in American studies from UCLA, uh, Asian American studies, thank you, from UCLA. Uh, prior to entering his doctoral program, William served for eight years as a public historian uh, with the Chinese Historical Society of Southern Cal, where he oversaw Chinatown Remembered Project, pairing college-age interns with community elders to document the history of the Chinese American community in Los Angeles in the early to mid 20th century. Uh, he is currently working on a book tentatively titled, uh, entitled uh, Performing Chinatown, which examines the history of LA Chinatown and its relationship to Hollywood film in the 1930s and 1940s. Okay. Hand for William? Okay. Uh, okay, and then we'll, 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 I'll introduce everybody first and then we'll. Oh, you're down. Yeah, 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 okay. And next will be uh, Jenny Cho. Uh, Jenny is the author of Chinatown in LA, Chinese in Hollywood, and Chinatown and China City in LA, published by Arcadia Publishing, and her books will be available. <laughs> um, as, as a filmmaker, she directed Revisiting East Adams a documentary about the first Chinese-American suburb in LA. She is currently a television editor, post producer, and associate producer with credits on National Geographic Television, Velocity Channel, DIY Network, and more. Uh, she holds degrees from the Univer <coughs> University of Southern California, UCLA, and Georgetown University. In the nonprofit sector, she served as a board member of the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California, and the organization of Chinese Americans in the greater Washington, D.C. chapter for several years. Okay, Jenny, give her a hand. <laughs> and, and next to Jenny is uh, Judy uh, Tsujun Wu. Uh, Judy is a professor and chair of the Department of Asian American Studies at UC Irvine. She received, received her PhD in U.S. history from Stanford University and previously taught for 17 years at Ohio State University. She authored uh, the book titled Dr. Mom Chung of the Fair-Haired Bastards, The Life of a Wartime Celebrity. Okay. Um, yeah, I was really impressed with that title when it came out. <laughs> uh, and that came out in 2005. I said, wow, <laughs> what's, what's that book about? Okay. Um, You'll find out. <laughs> okay. And, Radicals on the Road, Internationalism, Orientalism, and Feminism During the Vietnam Era. Uh, that was in 2013, Cornell University Press. Her current book project, a collaboration with political scientist Gwendolyn Mink, uh, explores the political career of Patsy Takamoto Mink, the first woman of color, U.S. congressional representative, and the co-sponsor of Title IX. Okay, that's under attack today. Uh, Wu also co-edited uh, Women's America, refocusing the past, uh, eighth ed edition, uh, Gendering the Trans-Pacific World, and Frontiers, a Journal of Women's Studies. Uh, she also co-edits uh, Women and Social Movements in the United States, uh, 1600 to 2000, 400 year period. Hey. Uh, okay, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and for just for writing all those books. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, Lenore Chin, uh, a native uh, San Franciscan. Okay, uh, maybe you're the only native San Franciscan. I, I, oh, no, oh, oh, wait, oh, sorry. sorry. I have family and friends. Okay, okay. Uh, Lenore Chin, a native of San Franciscan who graduated from SF State College with a BA in sociology, is a painter, photographer, and cultural activist who works to create structures of personal and institutional support that will both sustain critical artistic production and advance movements for social justice. Okay, right on. <laughs> uh, her current street photography uh, chronicles a rapidly changing socio-political landscape 
Uh, she was an original member of Lesbians in the Visual Arts, is a co-founder of the Queer Cultural Center, and has been active in the Asian American Women's Artists Association uh, since the group was founded, uh, which has shows every year, right? Yeah, on a regular basis, pretty much, yeah. Uh, from eight, 1988 to 1992, she served on the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. Okay, Lenore, again. And, okay, then Eddie. <laughs> oh, oh, there, okay, Eddie, yeah. Uh, Eddie Wong uh, was one of the founders of Visual Communications, uh, where he directed the documentary films uh, Wong Sing Sang, uh, Pieces of a Dream, and Chinatown Two-Step. He served as executive director of NATA, Center for Asian American Media, from 1996 to 2006, tenure period, and was executive producer of uh, Kelly Loves Tony. Yeah, I love that one. <laughs> and the series Searching for Asian America for PBS, he later became the executive director of the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation and produced several short video profiles of immigrants who were detained at Angel Island. Uh, in 2014, Eddie served as guest curator for the Smithsonian Institution's Asian Pacific American Center's A Day in the Life of Asian Pacific America, an online photo and video ex exhibition. Uh, his article, Broken Blossoms, uh, Four Chinese Women and Their Journey from Slavery to Freedom was published as the cover story in Prologue, the magazine of the National Archives in spring 2016. He is currently co-curating At First Light, The Dawn of Asian Pacific America, which is a retrospective of visual communications, first 20 years of documentary work in still photography, film, and video. Uh, this exhibit will be on display at the Japanese American National Museum in LA from May 25th of this year to October 20th of this year. Okay, Eddie, let's give him a hand. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll begin with um, uh, William Gao. Okay, we'll, we'll ask William a question. Um, okay, William. You, you picked an LA Chinatown map before 1950 as one of your slides. Uh, what can we learn about the development of Chinatown LA uh, from this map uh, before and during exclusion? Um, and then another question, uh, I, I noticed that you use uh, oral history in your work. Uh, how has uh, oral history uh, work documenting the Chinese American community uh, inform your understanding of history. Okay. Great, thank you, Harvey. Um, so I'm gonna speak a little bit about this, this map, just to start us off, and what I thought I would do is use this map as an introduction to, uh, to giving you a little bit of a broader idea of, of Los Angeles uh, and the Chinese American community uh, in that city. Um, as you notice here, uh, this is uh, LA before 1950, um, and you'll notice that on this map there are actually five different areas which are uh, identified as Chinese-American communities. Now this is one of the things that makes uh, Los Angeles distinct when you think about it in relationship to, uh, to San Francisco. Um, so LA had not only Old Chinatown, which is at the site of what is now uh, Union Station, um, but there were a number of other communities that popped up in addition to this. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about these over the course of the next four or five minutes. Um, now, what I want to talk about, though, before I, uh, before I kind of talk about each of these communities, though, is a little bit about why all of these communities are where they, where they are. So you'll notice that all of these, these communities are, are kind of centrally located in the, kind of in the middle of Los Angeles. And one of the things that's interesting about L.A. Um, is that L.A., when it was expanding, um, being sold uh, to, to folks around, around the country, um, really was rooted in... Uh, the selling of Los Angeles was really rooted in a, uh, a kind of like a paradigm of white supremacy, you could say, um, would be the way to put it, right? So uh, LA, um, Los Angeles as a city, um, when boosters were going about trying to promote this, uh, this area, actually were very, very conscious of selling this as an area for white people. 
Um, so not only did they sell it as an area for white people, um, but they also used restrictive covenants in order to limit the places where people could live. So if we look at uh, this, uh, this is Eagle Rock, which is a suburb of Los Angeles, and this is kind of like the most egregi uh, egregious kind of example of this. Um, uh, advertisement uh, from 1925. As you journey about Eagle Rock, enjoying immeasurably the ideal climate that is ours, you will observe that all the residents of Eagle Rock are of the white race. And you will, not, and you will note, sorry, that building restrictions have prevented the construction of unsightly homes. You will note our splendid schools, our lovely churches, our playground, and the many other tangible reasons for the happiness of our homes. And you will feel the spirit of contentment that pervades the entire community. So it's really important to kind of keep this kind of, um, th this uh, overt form of racism in the, in the back of your mind as we go and we talk about where it is where the Chinese Americans were able to live. So if we go back to this map here, right, so folks begin, uh, Chinese Americans begin um, here in old Chinatown. And then the, by 1909, you actually have the first number of people that are branching out to kind of live in other areas. And the second one of these that pop up is actually this one, number four. Uh, which is the city market Chinatown. So in 1909, um, uh, a group of Chinese American merchants paired with a number of Japanese American and uh, ca Caucasian Americans to form uh, this whole soup, wholesale produce market uh, around the area of 9th and San Pedro. Um, so this was a market where uh, local like vegetable peddlers could come and buy uh, things that they would sell later. Stores could come, like grocery stores could, mom and pop grocery stores could come and buy uh, wares uh, to sell. Um, and it became, uh, almost a second Chinatown, right? There was this giant um, Chinese American community that, that, that developed right in, this, uh, in the area, branching off of um, this, uh, this sit market. Um, now, as you might know, or might have heard, um, in the 1930s, uh, old Chinatown ended up being uh, destroyed to build Union Station. Um, and when this happened, uh, what you had occur was two competing Chinatowns popped up in Los Angeles. Uh, one of them was uh, called China City, and China City is the, um, the product of a woman named Christine Sterling. If you've been to Los Angeles, um, she is the woman who developed Olvera Street. So originally she had this idea of creating this almost like Epcot Center in the middle of downtown Los Angeles, where she would have these different kind of like um, ethnic villages, if you wanted to call them that, that white, the white tourists could come and, and visit. So she only built two of them, the first one being Olvera Street, um, and the second one being China City. So China City, uh, the idea was that she was going to sell uh, this kind of orientalized view of, of China to, uh, to, to white tourists who came through. And what she ended up doing to promote her China City was she actually took the set from The Good Earth, uh, the 1937 film The Good Earth, and she built it, um, uh, rebuilt it in, in Los Angeles. So um, if you're interested in seeing pictures in that, you should check out Jenny's book um, out there. Uh, uh, there's many, many great pictures of China City in the book. Um, so, so, so she, she, she does, a, does, does China City, uh, and her, competitor, uh, her competitors were a group of Chinese American merchants uh, in Los Angeles headed by, by a man named Peter Suhu. And what they did is they decided they were going to build this area that's called New Chinatown, and that's actually what Chinatown is commonly called Chinatown today. Uh, now what makes New Chinatown so distinct is that New Chinatown actually, um, these merchants got together, they formed a corporation, and then the corporation bought the land on which they were gonna build Chinatown. So this new Chinatown is really the first completely planned and owned Chinatown in the United States. It's actually almost like a, uh, like a mall, right? Now obviously you could say that parts of San Francisco were planned, um, but the Chinese Americans didn't own like every single plot in San Francisco in the same way that this, corp this Chinatown Corporation owned the entire Chinatown mall complex that they built new Chinatown in. Um, now the final one of these then begins to pop up uh, around the same period of time. Um, so folks are, are, as I mentioned before, working in this, uh, in this city market, and East Adams um, becomes a type of bedroom community for, uh, for people that are working up there in, uh, in the city market area. So by 1950, you actually have um, five different ethnic enclaves um, that can be considered a Chinatown. And that makes it very, very different from what we have here in San Francisco, right? San Francisco, uh, Chinatown, Chinese Americans are, are very much rooted in Chinatown. And the movement out to the Richmond district, which I think is the next place, doesn't, doesn't come anywhere near 1909. It probably happens, to, you know, I don't know, maybe like the 50s? Maybe someone out there knows that. Yeah. yeah. What, what's yeah, that? My, my family moved out there in 51. Okay, there we go. So probably, yeah, so in the 50s, right? So that's a lot, lot later that you, that you have this kind of, th this experience. Now, the other thing that's important to note here is that, as I showed you with this other slide, right, um, the, the Eagle Rock slide, is that 
this whole area is the area where all of the people of color in Los Angeles are being, are, are being uh, kind of put together, right? So all of the rest of the surrounding areas are white. Parts of East LA aren't, right? But all, most of all the other areas are white. And you have this really interesting mix of people that are all like living side by side to one another. So um, Chinese Americans in Los Angeles ended up when they were going to, to school, when they were interacting with people, especially the people in the, uh, in, the, in the city market in the East Adams area, went to really integrated, like diverse uh, public schools, which is a little bit different probably than it was, uh, you know, let's say 1920s in, uh, if you were Chinese American in San Francisco. Um, I'll say just a few more things uh, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Jenny who's going to tell you some personal stories uh, of community members. So um, another thing that's really interesting to note, right, when we think about like Chinatown um, in LA is that China, like uh, white photographers, filmmakers, in many ways were, were uh, obsessed with Chinatown. Um, China, they, they, you know, they, they, they were constantly talking about Chinatown and yet when you look at the number of Chinese Americans that were in Los Angeles, Chinese Americans do not make up a very large portion of the population, right? If you, you see here, um, you have 2,000 Chinese Americans roughly in 1900 and a little under 5,000 in 1940 out of a population here in 1940 of one and a half, uh, one and a half million people, right? So there are not that many Chinese Americans, but Chinatown looms large in the white popular imagination. In fact, it looms so large that if I were to just give you a little bit of a breakdown here of LA Times coverage, this is just the number of, I looked at ProQuest, which is the digital online kind of database, and I searched the number of times that Chinatown, the word Chinatown pops up to give you an idea. Chinatown between 1900 and 1909 appears 1,593 times. Now, if you compare that to a Sonora town, which is, which is the name that was given to a Mexican American community in, in LA, or Little Tokyo, Little Tokyo or Japan town, um, which is actually much bigger like numerically eventually than, uh, than Chinatown, you can see that there is this obsession, really would be the best way to, way to put it, uh, uh, with Chinatown and Chinese people. And so when we kind of look at photography from the period, particularly photography by whites, it's important to kind of keep that in the back of your mind, right? That, this is, uh, that there's this fascination with Chinatown, which uh, doesn't necessarily, um, uh, course, the, 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 that other ethnic groups in Los Angeles uh, that were even larger in number, um, wait, where did I go? Probably um, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't have. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and I'll pass it over to Jenny. For Jenny, uh, is um, your work covers the history of LA Chinatown, China City, and East Adams. Uh, what can we learn from those family legacies there that help establish uh, LA Chinatown as the first Chinese-owned Chinatown in the United States? Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. I came the farthest. I came from Maryland and Washington, D.C., where it was five degrees. <laughs> Okay, stepped off the plane into insta happiness. So thank you, Patricia and everybody. Um, I just wanna like thank Eddie because actually Will and I um, kind of graduated from the Visual Communications School of Oral History. So a lot of the research that we were talking about today is because we learned oral history from Eddie and Visual Communications. His uh, colleague, Bob Nakamura, was our professor at UCLA. So I just wanna say thank you, Eddie. Your legacy lives on through me and Will and um, everybody here supporting um, Chinese American history. And thank you all for coming. So this is a map of old Chinatown, and I just want to reiterate, um, this is all gone. So this is where the Union Station is, picking up from where Will was talking. Um, the plaza is still there, and there's one building called the Garnier Building, which is currently the home of the Chinese American Museum, which is still standing. Um, I encourage all of you go, to go visit. Um, I'm going to point out some stores on Apple Blasa Street, which is the top part of that pink their um, Apa Blasa is named after um, Juan Apa Blasa, who was a Chilean landowner. And the Chinese were not allowed to own the land of their businesses, but they established retail um, places. You're, we're gonna talk about the Sang Yuan Company, which is at the corner of Apa Blasa Street. So this is the um, kind of dry and dusty rows of where Chinatown looked like. This is a very rare uh, photo of children. Um, I'm gonna talk about how special it was just to for the, um, for the merchants to even have children because of the restrictive laws such as the 1875 Page Act um, and how the dirt roads were so muddy that you had to uh, traverse through wooden planks. Um, 
However, this is being the week before New Year, so Xin Yan Kuai La, and um, the Chinese, despite the discriminatory um, nature of the laws that prevented them from owning land and from getting married and um, so many restrictions, they still managed to maintain some traditions such as New Year. Um, this is a drawing of Negro Alley, and um, this, all of this was torn down. So we are very fortunate, um, we're talking about photography and history and the role. Um, one of the questions Harvey had for us was, um, are we as scholars satisfied with the um, photography that has been done of our respective Chinatowns? And I'm so grateful that we have had these images um, because I don't, I think there's a kind of slight exoticized lens, you know, of seeing this um, type of street with these, you know, very, very strange traditions for the turn of the century. Um, but kind of because of that fascination, we have of the other, we have these images that have preserved for um, over 100 years. So these are actually um, photos of Chinatown now torn down and building Union Station. This is the construction of Union Station, which opened a year after New Chinatown. So New Chinatown opened June 25th, 1938. Union Station opened in 1939. And so I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna see how good your memory is at the end of our hour. The names of the families I'm talking about in the next five minutes are Suhu, Suhu, Kwan, Louis, Lee, Chan. Six families. I'm going to see who can tell me. Suhu, Suhu, Kwan, Louis, Lee, Chan. Okay, so why are they so special and why are they so important? Chinatown in LA has really inspired a very passionate group of scholars who volunteer their time. No one got paid for you know the scholarship they did. Nobody got paid for any oral histories. I mean, I didn't get paid for my oral histories, Eddie. I don't know if you did, but we um, spent all of our free time going to these people's houses. Um, so Will and I interviewed Suhu Lung's grandson, Peter Suhu Jr. So Suhu Lung's store, the Sang Yun store, was a family store. Um, they it was actually really. Uh, neat and it did very well. He um, actually was able to raise a family of nine children and his son Peter Suhu Sr. would go on to become one of the co-founders of New Chinatown. So now we're putting a face, that's Sang Yan. He later on became blind so he wasn't actually able to see you know kind of the fruits of his labor from the 1890s. Um, and that's his son, Peter, who is now on the plaque of New Chinatown. And these are the names in Chinese of all of the founders who, at 75 cents a square foot, that's what they um, paid about $100 each to buy this plot of land in New Chinatown. Um, Peter Suhu Sr. Um, made an alliance with Herbert Lapham, who was a railway agent, who was sympathetic to the plight of the Chinese because they were all evicted from the old Chinatown and it was condemned, so nobody had any recourse. Um, it was, it inspired this fight, okay? The Chinese were not gonna go down and get evicted without a fight, so they fought and the, um, there was this, uh, it went to a vote in the city. So the vote was for, um, number one, is there going to be a consolidated Union Station or is, it, is there gonna be an elevated railway like Chicago has? And the vote was for the consolidated Union Station. The second vote for the city was where was this Union Station going to be? And um, referring to your map, it was uh, next to the plaza where the Chinatown was. So the campaign that Will was talking about with Christine Sterling was to um, condemn that whole area. Christine Sterling really wanted that area condemned because she wanted to kind of spring this new Chinatown Phoenix, uh, new China City Phoenix, but the Chinese wanted to own their land. Um, the businesses in China City were not owned by the Chinese, um, so they were still renting. And we know now that land in LA is almost priceless land now. So you can see the foresight that they had to start this planning in the 30s, um, despite all the discrimination that all their parents went through. So Peter Su, who had some amazing friends, his friend Y.C. Hung, who um, was affectionately called the hunchback, 
Not by me, but by, um, uh, it's quoted in Lisa C's book on Gold Mountain. He was the first Chinese to graduate from University of Southern California Law School and the first Chinese to pass the bar in California and one of the first Chinese to testify before Congress for, um, against uh, the exclusion laws. And so Peter Suhu and Y.C. Hong were instrumental along with the other founders of New Chinatown in establishing this land because um, Mr. Hong had his immigration office in the Hong building. So this is one of the buildings of New Chinatown, the development, and this has spawned a decades-long decades activism um, in New Chinatown. So this is uh, Mr. Hong with Senator Hiram Fong from uh, Hawaii. And so you can see um, Mr. Hong um, kind of taking lots of photos with dignitaries such as President Nixon in my book. And um, <laughs> they realized that they had to make alliances with civic leaders, um, political leaders, in order to survive. And so this started off kind of this branching out from the second generation, the first generation who were born in America, they had the confidence that their parents didn't have um, because they were now citizens. So Kwan, oh, I have to talk last, okay. The Kwans are still there in New Chinatown, four generations. So now I'm going into the second family. Um, Kwan Sun Dun's family, uh, Kwan Sundu's grandsons, Frank and Wally, opened Grand Star Restaurant, which is awesome bar. And um, he, they're pictured here with James Wong Howe, Academy Award winning Chinese American cinematographer. They're still there in New Chinatown. And they had, um, oh, this is Louis. So this Tui Farlow was the Kwan's restaurant, and next door is the Louis store, KG Louis. So Louis is the third family. So, ah, Kwan. Kwan, that's, um, the patriarch. This is a photo of him with his two wives, okay? He got both his wives, because that's how they rolled back then, all right? <laughs> he has two wives, okay? This is little Wally, who you saw with James Wong Hao. This is all their children, and they all pose together in a photo, okay? That is smooth, <laughs> all right? I don't know if y'all could pull that off, but I could not pull that off, okay? Um, I'm sorry, I have to speed through these now. So KG Louis' store, they're still there. That is Mr. Louis' um, son, William Louis, in his 70s, still running the store. Still there. Um, Daniel Hall, his um, son Wellington Hall is on the board of the Los Angeles Chinatown Corporation and they own the Golden Pagoda building, which was rented out to the Hop Louis restaurant. Still there. The Chan family, the innovators of the strawberry whipped cream cake, which single-handedly um, supported three generations of Chinese Americans. <laughs> that is the developer, Lun Chan. Okay, so th these are the Chans. Lun established the recipe for the cake. His brother, FC, um, was such a savvy businessman that he's the co-founder of East West Bank, which you have a branch on Clay Street, Clay and Montgomery. Um, so not only baking, but Banking. <laughs> All right, Lun Chan passed away in 2016. That's his son, Yulin Chan. If you go down, Phoenix Bakery is still there. That's the old branch, this is the new branch. The logo is designed by Tyrus Wong from Disney. They were all friends, okay? Tyrus, who passed away at 106, 104. Um, all friends. These buildings were torn down. They, um, Dragon's Den was owned by the C family. Tai C C uh, was the Caucasian ex-wife of Fang C, whose saga is chronicled in On Gold Mountain by Lisa C. She's witnessing her family's business getting torn down. Her story is very, very sad because she uh, married a Chinese. She was white, her husband was Chinese. Her family disowned her. She discovered her uh, Chinese husband had a wife in China and then uh, she met that wife, they went to China, and then she, um, they got divorced. It was really sad, and then he married another wife from China who was 16. That's how they roll. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, and early diversity. Um, so, 
not only Chinese and white, but Chinese and African American. So our friend Abraham Chin, uh, who passed away a few years ago, was Chinese and black because his dad um, married, a, that's his mom, an African American Caucasian lady named Pearl from Texas. She was an English teacher in old Chinatown. They met, got married. So he's actually one of the early, if not first generations of what we affectionately call as Blasians, black, China, black Asian. <laughs> And he, because he was over 10% African-American, went to serve in the Tuskegee Air Force. Do you remember the family names? Suhu, Suhu, Kwan, Chan, Lui, Li. All right. So the next speaker is uh, uh, Judy uh, Tsujun Wu. Uh, Judy, you wrote about Mom Chung and her role during the, uh, World War II. Uh, what is the background to her having such a prominent role uh, in Chinese-American women's history? Thank you. I'm so honored to be with this panel. These are legendary, legendary folks. And I apologize because I'm going to show you a short film and I'm not a filmmaker. Um, when I taught at Ohio State, we wanted to commemorate Japanese American internment. And we came up with this idea of, of training our students to do oral histories. We just happened to have someone on a campus who was from the BBC and she said, I'll help your students learn how to become documentary filmmakers. So, about 40 some students interview 10 individuals and then create short films about their experiences. A lot of them were forced eastward because of internment and then they eventually chose to go into the Midwest, Ohio, which I'm really grateful I'm not at right now. <laughs> um, but because of that experience, I decided to learn how to create digital narratives myself. And this is a chance, I often assign this to my students for them to create multimedia essays. So they tell a story and they can use music and they use visuals and they use poetry as a way to make a point or make an argument. So this is my digital narrative about Mom Chung and I'll talk about why I found her so fascinating and why we think we should, why we should remember her. I didn't expect to find someone like Margaret Chung in Asian American history. It's a fact it is that we women folk are beating all you men. You get evidence of it every day. She was a physician, a pioneer who crossed racial and gender boundaries to become the first Chinese American woman doctor. She publicly dressed like a man. Aren't women wonderful? Aren't women great? And she privately expressed longing, stole kisses, and occasionally shared a bed with other women. She never married and chose not to have children, at least not biologically. Instead, she adopted nearly 1,000 offspring, mostly American pilots, who shared her love for the United States and China. I'm the last of the red hot mama. They've all cooled down but me. Flap of them, say what do they know? Come get your hot stuff from this volcano. As well as her hatred for Japan. During World War II, she was a celebrity who socialized with actors, politicians, military leaders, opera stars, and cabaret singers. She was Mom Chung, and they were her fair-haired bastards. She was traditional, yet transgressive, asexual, yet queer, maternal, yet masculine, exotically different. yet iconically American. How might it have felt to be so different, to want to fit in against near impossible odds? I wish I could wake up one morning and be blonde hair and blue eyed. All my 
troubles would go away, Margaret Chung told her adopted granddaughter. And yet, to want to change the world so that it might not be so painful to be oneself. She has five months to live, but she's not perturbed by it. September 26, 1958. This closes a very delightful and inspiring chapter in our lives. God bless and bless her beautiful soul. There will never be another Mom Chung. January 1959, diary entries of adopted son and Vice Admiral Charles Lockwood. our attention to San Francisco Chinatown, which is the place that I associate with Margaret Chung. And it's so wonderful to be able to talk about her in her home city. She didn't grow up here. She grew, was born in Santa Barbara. Her family moved to Ventura County, then to Los Angeles. She did a residency in Illinois, but this is where she chose to have her home was in San Francisco. When you leave me, you know it's gonna grieve me. Gonna miss your big fat mama, your fat mama. Some of these So days. as far as I know, I think she's the first American-born woman to become a physician in the United States. There were other Chinese immigrant women who came to the United States, and they were often recruited by American missionaries who were working abroad. And their interest in cultivating Chinese women who could become doctors is connected to this idea that if they can help heal the body, they might be able to help heal the soul. And Margaret Chung was very much influenced by those same set of networks. Her father had converted to Christianity. It was a way for him to learn English. Her mother was one of these young girls who was sold by her family because of poverty, ended up in the United States, and was very likely a prostitute in training. But she had these missionary women would go into brothels and raid them and try to rescue these young women. So her mother grew up in a mission home learning English, learning to be a proper Victorian middle, uh, middle class, um, potentially wife. Um, she served as a translator, and I think that's actually how her parents got together, that these missionaries in some ways played matchmakers, right? There were so many more men compared to women, um, and here was this upstanding Chinese immigrant man who was a Christian. Here's a woman who had been groomed by the missionaries, and that's how they came together. And that, that desire to serve China was very much part of Margaret Chung's desire to become a physician and to provide greater service. So her life, I think, um, raises two really important questions for me. One is, how do you become Chinese American in a place in which you're despised? She was born in 1889, just seven years after the Chinese Exclusion Act. And that act not only prevented Chinese immigrant laborers from coming to the United States, but it also said if you're an immigrant from China, you can never become a US citizen, or you're perpetually foreign. So what does it mean to be born to this country, but that, that culturally and racially you're always viewed as an outsider? Um, and so for Margaret Chung, she was thinking, well, well, maybe I can provide service to China. Maybe I can go there um, and um, provide medical care. But she was sort of in between. She wasn't Chinese enough to have the language skills and the contacts to be of service in China. And she wasn't white enough, right, to represent the United States. So she ends up in San Francisco Chinatown instead, trying to provide medical care to the people within the community. Another question that raises for me is, how do you queer Chinese American history? Right? She's someone who didn't marry, didn't have children, and these are very unusual choices given the gender demographics in the community. If you saw those images right, of the merchant men um, and their, you know, their wives and their generations, right? that is the model of family 
And in many ways, that is a model of resistance, right? Given the immigration exclusion that occurred, to be able to have a family in the United States, given the anti-immigration investigation they lost, to have a family in the United States is a sign of resistance. But Margaret Chung consciously chose not to marry, not to have children. And instead, she formed queer forms of kinship. So she adopted all these people in the military, these entertainers. They had a whole ceremony that they held at her house. Um, and the people who had the highest rank, the admirals, were the ones who would clean up at the end of the day. Right? So she would really think about playing with the social hierarchies. And then she also had these hidden, uh, erotic, emotional, romantic relationships with other women. Um, so I think I'm, I'm running out of time, but I'm happy to talk more about this. But I think for her, it raises again for me the question of how do you create an identity when that identity is so deeply despised, both in terms of race, and gender, and sexuality? And then how do we, if we focus on someone like Margaret Chung, how does it shift our understanding of racialization? I often think about Chinatown as being a racially bounded space. Right? Um, and this is something that William's presentation really emphasizes. But I think your, your maps also indicate that it was never completely racially segregated. It was more imagined as racially segregated. And a place like San Francisco Chinatown borders North Beach, which was the queer community at that time. And so there were interactions that cross racial boundaries, that cross sexual boundaries as well. Okay, thank you. Our next uh, panelist, uh, Lenore Chin, um, will introduce to the audience um, a uh, photographs of her her, your uncle, yeah. uh, Benjamin Chin, and uh, we'll look at, we'll see what we can learn about the development of San Francisco Chinatown uh, from these photographs, okay, as an insider. Rather than going through laborious descriptions of each, I'm just going to show you a sample from uh, Benjamin Chin's Oakland, uh, excuse me, San Francisco Chinatown series from 1947 to 1948. Um, as a little background, uh, when I was very young, my dad used to talk about my uncle's adventures, and I have quite a few members from my family here today. Um, so that's how I learned about my uncle, and there was always a picture in our living room of a shot he had taken in Paris. That was the only picture I had ever seen of his work until quite late in his life. Um, and finally, what happened was, uh, I mean, he always had a camera at every family reunion, uh, but we never really knew much about it except for the little stories I would hear growing up. However, what happened was in the mid-90s, San Francisco State, uh, along with some uh, folks uh, I think they were connected to the de Young and the Smithsonian, embarked on a major project of gathering data, trying to identify Asian American artists, including photographers and sculptors and whatnot, from uh, about 1870 to about 1970. And as a result of that early project, they did a uh, exhibition at San Francisco State University, my alma mater. Uh, and my friend Wiley Wong, who's in the audience here, alerted me to it. And they did this project called With New Eyes uh, toward an Asian American art history in the West. Well, uh, they were still gathering data, and I found out that they were interested in learning more about anybody who one might know. So I got a hold of a friend of mine, Diane Tani, and she in turn got a hold of Irene Poon, who was involved with the Chinese Historical Society of America, which is a co-partner in this uh, project with the Chinatown Talks uh, here. And so she met him and uh, became interested, took him under her uh, wing, uh, particularly because she learned about his history uh, of having studied with Ansel Adams in the first school of uh, fine art photography at the California School of Fine Arts. Um, and this was like right after World War II, after he had come home from the military. And, uh, and then she saw his pictures. He uh, grew up and lived almost his entire life, except for when he went to uh, the military and off to Paris for a couple of years in the early 50s. 
He lived on Commercial Street, right up the block from where you would see the RNG Lounge now on the corner of Kearney and, and uh, Commercial. So he was there the entire time, and what he did was he photographed his whole neighborhood. The people that he knew, the merchants, uh, you know, all the shopkeepers, the people that he saw walking by his house around Grand Avenue, Washington, Jackson, you name it. And it was a very different Chinatown, as you can imagine. Um, we, didn't, we didn't yet have those uh, glitzy curio shops uh, that you see today. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so he would take his camera. He, he worked in a large format and medium format cameras. Uh, uh, medium formats are uh, uh, smaller negatives, they're about two and a quarter. And the large formats are usually like graphic views, four by five or larger negatives. Uh, but I think he preferred, after a while, using smaller cameras uh, because it was easier to capture what he was seeing. So what I'm going to show you today uh, are samples from that. Some of these were featured in a 2003 exhibition that Irene Poon was able to um, uh, initiate and curate um, at the Chinese Historical Society on Clay Street. So uh, this was a... Uh, this was on uh, Washington, uh, around Stockton, I believe. Oop, he got cropped. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, if you don't see it, there is a website on, uh, online, uh, benjaminshin.com. Uh, and there's also a Facebook page uh, that we periodically update with news and more pictures. And uh, that's a gentleman uh, looking at the news. A Chinese school teacher, very serious. <laughs> Another one of his uh, more arty shots. Um, I wanted to say also that uh, in the early days, uh, if you saw pictures of Chinatowns uh, here, uh, either by uh, Arnold Genth, or in LA by uh, Anton Wagner, um, they tended toward what was called a pictorialist style, which is uh, soft focus, uh, sometimes to the extreme by some photographers where they actually put gauze to make the images a little more fuzzy and impressionistic. Uh, but what Ben uh, learned as a fine art photographer at the California School of Fine Arts was a a different way of, uh, a different approach to photography uh, that was championed by Ansel Adams and Minor White, who he also studied under and, um, and got to know uh, what were called the uh, West Coast uh, photographers. Um, theirs were what was considered more modernist in photography and uh, uh, sharp focus as opposed to the earlier style. So uh, while they, did manipulate in the darkroom. Uh, it was in a different way. They, they tended toward the sharp focus, maybe a little more contrast, and trying to draw detail, although this is sort of an exception to that because you see more concentration on shape and form. And uh, I threw this in here even though he's not a Chinese resident per se, but he was a fellow who had his shoeshine business on Kearney. Uh, near Clay, I believe. Um, and so that was on the outskirts of Chinatown. So just to show that, you know, while predominantly there were Chinese residents, there were others who had little businesses going on as well. That might date the period if you know anything about boxing. <laughs> And that's a Chinese funeral. We didn't put a lot of images like that on our website because a lot of us still, even though we're Chinese American, other generations, it's a little superstitious. And these young kids here are I have, watching, I believe, the Chinese New Year parade. 
<laughs> and it's interesting, when you look at it, you see the, uh, the different classes, the different attire and everything uh, from the little, the, the boy on the far left all dressed up in his little suit to the young man on the far right who looks like he has maybe some holes in his pants. Bok choy. Getting hungry? <laughs> also, um, I'm not sure at what point Grant Avenue changed, but many years ago, and I think in this time frame still, uh, Grant Avenue used to run traffic in both directions. That's no longer the case unless somebody makes a mistake. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that got kind of squished. Um, a more expanded view. This is a, uh, this is a family portrait. Uh, my uncle is on the far right and my dad is next to him. Uh, but this was taken by the uh, uh, famous, well, at least in the Chinese American community, well-known um, May Photo Studio back in 1928. My uncle told me that uh, his father, our, our grandfather, used to take the family to this studio every few years to take this formal picture. Um, the May Studios operated, I believe, around uh, from the 1920s through the 50s, something like that. Um, there are friends of mine in the audience, <coughs> Wiley Wong, Emiko Amori, uh, Lydia Tanji, and maybe a few others, who are working on a, a documentary project about this studio. So, you know, stay tuned, you'll learn more about uh, what they did. They focused on a lot of uh, portraits and um, opera actors and whatnot. Um, and uh, another little story here, my grandmother, I never knew my grandparents, they, they passed before I came along. Uh, but when I was growing up, my fam I used to hear whispers in the family about a concubine in the family. I never knew what that meant, you know, <laughs> a, as a young person. Um, and, uh, and also my grandfather, uh, when he started over here, he started off as a merchant. Um, which enabled him to stay. Uh, however, at some point, his main business was owning and running gambling houses, which was not uncommon in that day. Um, so anyway, I used to hear all these little stories, and, uh, and my mother would get a little, she would kind of cringe when she started, you know, when these topics started coming up, you know, we're not supposed to talk about those things. Well, I found out much later that it was my grandmother here who was the second wife. Uh, I don't know what happened to the first one. I think she, she was still in China. After 12 children, she died in her 40s. Yeah, um, not a very happy situation. Um, so anyway, uh, all of these people are now gone. Um, we lost the last aunt uh, several years ago. She lived into her 90s, but Ben lived to about 87, I think, something like that. Um, and so he's, he's there, very young. He learned photography uh, from an older brother when he was about 10. And, and that was sort of his saving grace throughout his life because when he ended up in the military, that's what he continued to do. He, he uh, worked at, uh, at uh, Hickam Air Force Base in uh, Hawaii. And, and photography was one of the skills that enabled him to you know, go through life, and um, he maintained his friendships from the California School of Fine Arts until the day he died. Um, so that's his history. Um, he's also part of Judy Young's um, book, uh, Chinese Historical Society and Arcadia published this as part of their series as well. Um, so anyway, that's my story of my uncle. And then we have um, uh, Eddie Wong, um, Eddie, you researched and wrote about Chinese prostitution during exclusion. Um, what is 
explain how, what is, does exclusion have to do with the growth of prostitution? Uh, also, what led to its decline? And, and then also your, your research on the life of David Sum, the musician. Uh, what dimension did that research provide uh, for an understanding of the growth of Chinatown and Chinese American history? Okay. Is there anything else you want me to cover? <laughs> <laughs> okay, five minutes, here it goes. Um, well, I'm gonna not answer any of the questions because, well, basically what it is, uh, there's, there's, there's one thread between some of this work and that is music. You know, I, I really love music. And so I started researching what, what, what is the soundtrack for Chinese American history? And from the first time someone landed in the United States or came through Chinatown, what did they hear? So I started doing research on, you know, like old folk music and wooden fish songs, all that kind of stuff. And I ran across something called Sing Song Girls. I said, what the heck is a sing song girl? Well, these were women who were, were, in some cases, they were actually prostitutes who performed. They played Chinese musical instruments and they, um, they actually were in the high class brothels in Chinatown and they, they entertained, you know, wealthy, wealthy men. And they also played at banquets for a lot of the, the tongs. And so that's how I got into the Broken Blossom story, uh, where it was really um, trying to figure out sing song girls and I read about prostitution in Chinatown. And uh, I came across this case uh, in 1935 where, where four women testified against their slave owners and they actually won. And it kind of broke the whole prostitution uh, trade open. Um, so to answer your question, uh, <laughs> prostitution has been around Chinatown since the very beginning. And it has to do with the fact that it was a primarily male workforce. And San Francisco in those days, uh, was a wide open town. There were prostitutes of every nationality, French, you know, African, Mexican, etc. And uh, Chinese prostitutes were brought in by the tongs, by companies who made money. It was a monetary enterprise. And um, very horrible life for people. And I go into some of that in the Broken Blossoms article. But um, it's related to exclusion, obviously, because Chinese women, um, by social practice and also by, by exclusion laws like the Page Act and other acts uh, were, were not allowed to come. So the Chinese did not form you know, families here, except in the cases of having wives and, and daughters of merchants come in. So what I'm, and the other link to music is David Sum, the jazz man. So there was, you know, actually kind of funny because these cases happened around the same time, you know. Uh, in the late 20s, 30s, where some of the women in the story came and where David was uh, playing jazz and going on vaudeville. So there is kind of a connection there. But what I'll, I'll do now is just, um, this is um, a, a longer version of the article that got published in Prologue, which is the magazine of the National Archives. Um, and so I had a chance to use, uh, play around with long form journalism. This is like a 15,000 word article. And so I want to break it up a little bit, you know, and uh, put videos in. And so I went and stole a lot of photographs from the San Francisco Public Library. <laughs> I hope nobody is, will tell, tell on me. <laughs> I mean, you have to pay rights for everything. So I just sort of borrowed the, borrowed the photographs, right? And so kind of very YouTube-ish. Um, so why don't I, you scroll up a little bit and there's a little intro uh, video. I click on that, that play thing, okay? Okay, so those are some of the women who were brought in uh, supposedly to be married off to Chinese merchants. And when they got here, they were then sold into prostitution. And then later on in the article, I uh, actually go to the locations where people negotiated the sale of people, they had auctions. Uh, I went to some of the old hotels, uh, which are still there, uh, where they had to you know, work. 
uh, so on and so forth. Um, but a lot of these photographs, I, mean, I use those photographs from the library mainly to set the context of like this is what Chinatown looked like when the story was happening. This is Wang Siduk, a homeboy from Toisan, probably in my village. Uh, and, and this is all of his immigration photos. And um, you can kind of see him progress from young man to uh, this guy who like owned a hardware store in Chinatown and who also ran prostitution rings. He financed it, he went in China and recruited the people, and he made a lot of money out of it. That's his son. He brought his whole family over. Uh, his wife knew that he was running prostitutes. His older daughter knew he was running prostitutes. And because um, he brought one of the women into the home, family home, and, and made her wash dishes and do the laundry. And she said, man, this is like crazy. You cannot have this woman here. Because she was actually kind of like a, like a second wife for a while, you know. But then she was sold off. So very complicated, twisted kind of stories. Um, but, um, you know, all these photographs, I was just really lucky to find at the National Archives because once I read about the case, I went there and said, I gotta find all these people. And then I did more research and uh, then found, uh, eventually found the grave site of one of the women who actually ended up staying in San Francisco. Most of the women who were uh, freed from prostitution won the case. They were sent back to China because they had actually come here illegally. And so they were forced to go back. So. Um, this is sort of an illustration of using photographs from public history, from archives. So I want to switch to another example now. We'll switch to the David Sum story. Now, David Sum, I met, God, in the 80s when I was still doing research on uh, the whole Chinatown nightclub scene. And before that era, there was uh, vaudeville in the 20s. And like, I had no idea Chinese were doing that kind of work. And so we're going to go to the first one, OK? The musical mandarins, because it shows more family albums. Ragtime band, come on and hear, come on and hear, it's the best band in the land. Now you can hear the bugle call like you never heard before. Makes you wanna go to war. It's just the best band what am I gonna do? Come on and hear, come on along, let me take you by the hand to meet the man, to meet the man who's the leader of the band. And if you want to hear that one. Okay, so, you know, this is a, a, you don't see pictures of our, like, grandparents like this who are, like, having, like, lots of fun, styling, you know, um, chasing women. I mean, th those women were, like, the, every time they went to, they went to the local Chinese restaurant, and, you know, they had a big banquet and stuff, and they would meet the local girls and the whole thing. I mean, it's all very innocent, and this is the 20s, I think, but it's just another side of like, you don't, you don't see your grandparents or great parents, you know, having fun like that, you know, so 
if you have relatives, go raid the family photo albums. You'll find all kinds of stuff. Anyway, I was really fun to get that stuff. Now, the next clip is of his last band, the Cathayans, and this has more uh, in his family album of the social history of the, the, the rice bowl parties and things like that. So I'll just share that, and that'll be it for me. So David Sum became a pharmacist. He had a, a drugstore in Oakland, and um, you know he donated a lot of his time playing at On Luck, you know, at lunch, playing piano, and he was a fixture in Chinatown at you know Chinese Presbyterian Church. So he always loved music, and he played a lot. Now you can read the whole article because the article really is about growing up in Chinatown. It's about what poverty was like and how you know like people really scraped to get by. His parents were missionaries. They're something called coal porter missionaries. They were distribute little tracks, you know, at you know, bars, restaurants, wherever. Um, so he had a hard life growing up. But uh, so you can read the full story at a um, uh, sort of a, a magazine that I publish online called East Wind. So I'll just go to eastwindezine.com and there's a whole bunch of articles and uh, both about history, but also about current events, politics, etc. So basically that's my presentation. It's like you know, you find history in lots of different places, and it's, it's not always in the footnotes, you know? <laughs> and so you have to sort of find it everywhere you can, and I'm particularly interested in social history, like how people lived, what they were thinking, and uh, what choices did they make. So um, I just encourage uh, you to follow those things, like be a detective, just sort of figure out what kind of stories you want to tell. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, wonderful uh, talks. I was really intrigued. Um, it's a double-sided question for everybody, or anyone can answer. Um, I noticed a lot of non-Chinese people of color participating um, and being a part of both Chinese and Chinatown history. And I was wondering if that's very specific or unique to San Francisco and Los Angeles. And the other is that I also noticed the other side of that coin is that Chinese Americans were consumers of mainstream narratives that also created almost animosity against other people of color. Um, so I was wondering if um, what what your thoughts are on that on those two sides of the same coin. Thank you. So after this, Harvey, you'll take a question and then I'll take it over on this side. Okay. Maybe I'll just start. So. Margaret Chung's relationships tended to be with white Americans, but her 
I would say a lot of her close relationships with, were with ethnic white Americans. So Sophie Ducker is Jewish American. Um, there's that quote, like, your God will be my God, right? So she's talking about this kind of Christian Jewish reference, you know, kind of divide preference. Also, one of her really close relationships was, is with Elsa Gidlow, who is the first um, North American lesbian poet that's been published. So she lived right on the edge of Chinatown, and I think for economic reasons, it was less expensive, but I think she also had a fascination with Asian culture. So there's various ways in which these people are crossing racial ethnic boundaries. I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but there is an element of self-orientalism that you see with Margaret Chung and also these other performances, because one way that you can get acceptance is to play to the stereotype. So Margaret Chung had an office in, office in Chinatown. It was next to a photograph studio, and she would decorate her office in a particular way. Not all her clients are Chinese Americans. Some people are from outside the community. The same thing with her parties. She gave away little jade Buddhas to her thousand plus sons. Um, she, her favorite meal was corned beef and cabbage, but she would make fried rice and barbecue spare ribs for what her sons expected of her. So I think there's, it's part of I think, the negotiation of how do you be an ex-American, right? How do you gain acceptance when your culture and your racial identity is not accepted? So one thing that I, w I mentioned briefly that I think is really interesting was when we talk about um, Los Angeles is that um, particularly the, um, even though they're, they're sometimes called Chinatowns, the, the, the um, city market area and the East, uh, the East Adams area um, were very, very ethnically diverse. They had large numbers of Chinese Americans that were living there, but Chinese Americans were living side by side next to African Americans, next to Mexican Americans. Um, and so there was a ton of like cross uh, uh, ethnic friendships and rivalries that were going on. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is because all of the people of, the majority of people of color are kind of located in this one area, is that they go to these very integrated schools. So it's not like, I mean, it was a, in LA, I think even more so than in San Francisco, it was very, very normal if you were a, a, a Chinese American living in the period before, let's say, World War II, um, to have lots of interactions both with ethnic whites and also with, um, with, with uh, people of color, other, other people of color, yeah. Uh, I just want to follow up on Judy's point. With the case of David Sum, they and the musical mandarins and the Cathayans, more so with the musical mandarins, vaudeville, they were novelty acts. It's like, no, the stereotype was that Chinese couldn't play because we can't keep time, you know? <laughs> and, you know, can't sing, can't dance, you know, whatever. Uh, I don't know what we're good at, but um, <laughs> maybe having kids. Uh, so anyway, so they, they marketed themselves, uh, and, and they, frankly, played a lot of like um, novelty songs. They, they would sing, they would do Irish ballads, you know, like the, the, these, they had several reviews, like uh, Wu's Oriental Review, these, all these great vaudeville acts. Where they were basically kind of doing blackface, yellowface, whiteface all at once, you know. Um, so that's that. But I think they, they um, you know, for David Sum at least, he was a true jazz fanatic. I mean, I asked him, who do you like listening to? And it was like, you know, Oscar Peterson. It was like the new wave jazz people in the 50s, bebop. And so he was really kind of a hip guy, really hip for a pharmacist. But, uh, <laughs> and okay, now I grew up in LA, okay? And so uh, I want to address this question of in integrated schools. I mean, it's, it's true, they were integrated, but there was a lot of tension. I mean, I grew up in Hollywood which is really different. My dad had a laundry there. And I went to predominantly Jewish high schools. I didn't even know white people until I went to college. And then I went to UCLA and I met WASP. And they were like, definitely different than Jews. I mean, <laughs> I mean Jews, OK, frankly, Jews are just a lot hipper. I mean, there's nothing, there's no two ways about it, man. Um, but my cousins lived in East Adams, you know? And we'd go have dinner and they talk about, well, we had fights with the Bloods. And I said, what's a, what's a blood? Uh, it's, those are African Americans. So, you know, there was like, and there was also tension between Chinese and Japanese. Because my, my, my friend, my cousin, was dating a Japanese American girl. And the father threw him out of the house for that, you know? So it was integrated, but there was a lot of turmoil in the, in the 60s as we were growing up. So that's, that's another part of the story. I, I also noticed um, one of the slides uh, was referring to the uh, the rice bowl parades. Um, <clears throat> actually, during 
Uh, actually, even before World War II, you could say that there, there was interaction uh, between, um, especially in terms of the labor movement, because uh, Harry Bridges uh, opened the door uh, for Chinese labor, you know, to become members of the labor movement. And so, th th so there was a lot of interaction uh, from there. And then they, th then they had uh, offices, uh, Chinese Workers Mutual Aid had an office in San Francisco Chinatown that uh, taught unionism, and, and then there was an unemployed uh, council. That was, there was a Chinese unemployed council, but it was very much connected with the overall unemployed movement. So, th so these were changes that were taking shape during the 30s also, okay? Hi, thank you all for coming and just blowing all of our minds, I would say, for me especially. I would love to know how we can support your work how can we buy your books or watch some documentaries or like how do how do we beyond this talk continue to stay involved or in touch with what you've shared with us? Well, I think one of the things that I wanted to say that I you know rambling through my spiel today, um, look for us. A lot of us are on social media. That's how we form our networking for our arts and political communities. Uh, like I mentioned, we have a Benjamin Chin Facebook page and, and a website, so keep a lookout for those. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, when my cousins, some of whom are here today, and I got together before our uncle died, and he died in 2009, uh, for many years, he really didn't talk about his own work. He, I don't think he really uh, understood how valuable his work was. So one of the things I wanted to say is that if you have elders and they have documents, photos, whatever, I know that my historian scholarly friends are always horrified when they find out that something's been dumped. And a lot of stuff doesn't end up in public collections. So that's another thing to keep in mind. If you have people in your family or you know people that have information, try to get it from them before they pass on or before you get to a point where you can't remember. <laughs> you know, Because it's, it took me years to get some of the stories out of my uncle and my dad, uh, but my uncle particularly because he was a very private person. But because I knew some of these stories, I just started talking and talking and trying to get more information. He always thought, well, why would anybody be interested? He always thought people would be more interested in his more luminary friends. But it's those ordinary stories that count, whoever they are, you know? And, and like some of the images that we're seeing today, well, you know, they, when, they, when these people were alive, they probably didn't really realize how much of a pioneer they were in their time. But years go by, and if you don't get those stories or somebody doesn't take an interest in excavating, it's lost. Um, I had a friend, Danielle Cornell, who was a curator at the De Young Museum. And when I was uh, invited to be a pan on a panel with him about Ruth Asawa, uh, he, he said, history does not happen uh, by accident. You have to advocate. And too many artists, their histories, their contributions to the cultural landscape are lost because families a lot of times who end up with these artifacts, their work, their body of work, they're either overwhelmed or they don't know what to do. And they end up in trash cans or dumpsters as in the case that happened to the May photos, a lot of them were, ended up in dumpsters. And, and if people like Wiley and others had not discovered them and salvaged them, they wouldn't be in archives at Stanford or any other places like that. So that's something else to consider as well. Could I say one thing? Um, so, f so for me, um, my, my genesis as a scholar came through my volunteer work for the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California, which is a small nonprofit. So if folks are looking to support, um, write a check to them, donate, they're a 501c3. Um, really, like, that's, like, that's where I met, uh, well, I didn't meet Jenny, but Jenny and I worked on a lot of our, uh, of our projects together. The map here is, is a product of, of volunteers before us who put together this book, Linking Our Lives, which is one of the um, pioneering books of Asian American women's history. Um, so uh, 
yeah, they do annual campaigns every year. Uh, yeah, that's one way to support. I brought seven books <laughs> from Maryland. They're $21.99. $11.50 goes to the California Historical Society. $11.49 goes to the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California, so I'm not getting any money, but you can support me by not making me take these back home. <laughs> That's all I want. Um, it's Chinese in Los Angeles. I brought one copy of Chinatown in China City. This is the only copy that I have, and you're buying my only copy. I bought this date. I wrote this dated Chinese in Hollywood book, which I don't promote anymore because it doesn't include crazy rich Asians because it only goes up to 2012. So it's a little bit dated, but it does include broken blossoms, Eddie. So um, I brought one copy because if you're really into Chinese in Hollywood, I'm probably going to hear from you. But this is Bruce Lee and Nancy Kwan um, in The Wrecking Crew. Nancy Kwan, you know from Flower Drum Song. Um, Bruce Lee trained her in martial arts for this really um, unique female spy movie called The Wrecking Crew. And I got permission from both his daughter and Nancy to use this photo. So it's actually very, it's, that's worth the price itself. Um, and the second way you can support is um, Will and I's documentary Revisiting East Adams is in the collection of the Los Angeles Public Library. So if you have friends in LA, Tell them to go check out that DVD because if, the, if no one checks out the DVD, the library disposes over time of unchecked out materials. So they don't even have to watch it. Just go check it out. <laughs> you know, roll, keep it in the car and then return it. And then it'll stay in the Los Angeles Public Library because everybody we interviewed is passed on except for two people. So just to know that their history is in the Los Angeles Public Library was worth the free labor that we did to make it on MiniDB. For you millennials, MiniDB <laughs> was a format that was used in the early aughts. So um, that's, that's worth watching in itself. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, actually, that video probably will be available on Canopy which is an online streaming service. And a lot, of, you know, a lot of the early work I did at Visual Communications will also be up this spring. And uh, I did a documentary on Chinese American music called The Sound of Pleasure. So that might be on there as well. But that'd be great. East Adams should be up, up, um, up on there. And just stay in touch with uh, all the organizations, the Historical Society and their stuff. And I want to point out, Harry Chuck is here tonight. And Harry is working on a monumental documentary about Chinatown social justice movements from the early 60s to the present. So Harry, why don't you stand up? Okay, talk to him afterwards. I mean, that's gonna be a monumental, uh, interesting piece of work. So, you know, the work just keeps on going. Uh, do we have yeah, hi. one I, more? I okay. have uh, three, three short questions. Uh, first of all, um, I know Eddie's mentioned several places that his uh, films are in, in the East-West uh, e-zine. I'm wondering if the Mam Chung uh, documentary is online anywhere. The music, was, that was just fabulous. Um, it, it, so that was one question. The second question is Benjamin Chin. The first time I ever heard of Benjamin Chin or saw anything by him, I was uh, at a friend's house and, and I don't know if it was a, an original photograph. I thought it was. And I thought it was bought at his studio. But I was wondering where the, the, the negatives are, is it remains in the family? And the very third question is, the prostitutes who just died in Chinatown, um, if there's a burial site, or was it just nobody knows where they are? So those are the three questions. Thank you. Thank you for all. I couldn't see where the voice was coming from. Oh, sorry. Um, in terms of Benjamin Chin's uh, negatives and prints, the bulk of the negatives and prints uh, are now archived at the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, so they are now available for research, and I know a lot of people, curators and whatnot, uh, often 
uh, access their resources when they put projects together, like they did a Gary Winogran at SFMOMA and they accessed a lot of his stuff there. So uh, Ben is in good company along with some of his friends like Ansel Adams and Imogene Cunningham and others. Uh, the other place where some of his work uh, is now in the permanent collection of SFMOMA. And my cousin Adam and, and Rich Shreve and Newton's over there in the back uh, on your side. Uh, we're always on the lookout for additional places to you know, spread the archival prints that we still have. We do have some, uh, but like I say, the bulk of them is at those two primary places. And so we're looking at a number of different places that make sense and, and are a good fit for his body of work. Um, I can address the question about where the uh, early Chinatown prostitutes are buried. No one actually knows for sure because the original um, Potter's Field, where poor people were, were buried, is now the Lincoln Park Golf Course. And so um, they, those bodies were, were moved when they built the bob, uh, golf course to another cemetery, uh, I believe sort of near USF. Um, uh, but. In, nobody really knows for sure because there are, there's a lot of rumors that many, many bodies were still left at the golf course. And there is a memorial at that golf course uh, to, um, well, all kinds of people who might have been buried there. So that's the short answer. Thanks so much for your comments about the video. It is on my Facebook page, um, but I think it'll probably be posted as part of this, and it is open to the public, so you don't have to all friend me <laughs> that you're really interested. Um, I just want to say I'm, I'm so happy with your question because it is amazing to see this turnout on a Thursday evening, <laughs> that you're here because you're so deeply interested in history, and I think that curiosity is so important, and I really hope that that will inspire all of you to think about your own projects. I think about someone like Margaret Chung, and actually there are people who were in Southern California, Chinese Historical Society, who interviewed, who were interviewed, and they talked about her. But their interviews in some ways were edited, so the transcripts had edited versions about her. And when I went back to listen to the tapes, the person was saying, oh, she was a lesbian. But that phrase didn't show up in the transcript, right? So there's all this kind of self-editing that happens within communities. And so I think we really need to have that curiosity when we see images, when we see something, like to, to dig deeper and find out more about these really remarkable individuals. Um, so in talking to elders or like interviewing them, how do you get them to talk about the juicy stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Like, yeah. You're, I think I think we are the elders now. Yeah. yeah. Let her rip. Um, no, I think for the older, you know, unfortunately, the older generations have passed. You know, like David's son passed away years and years ago. So we're not going to get the stories. We're, we're going to barely get the stories from the 40s now, right? And so, like, we're a lot of us. Well, I, I'm 68, so I'm a child of the 50s, and so I can tell you about racial covenant laws in LA, why we couldn't buy a house in Hollywood, things like that. But you know, it's, it's different social mores. I mean, our generation, you know, frankly, we did drugs. You know, what can I say? <laughs> we did a lot of things. Um, so, and um, we're, not, we're probably not that shy about talking about it. But so that's who you're dealing with. You're dealing with people <laughs> like of my age now in terms of trying to get, and younger. Your parents are probably younger than I, way younger than I am. And so, You'll probably get a lot of 80s references. I don't know. I really didn't want to know about their sex lives. <laughs> Sometimes, some of these interviews took me a year of calling every month. And they, I would be like, hi, it's Jenny again. Would you like to sit for an early history? And they'd be like, click. You know, and so when they finally sat down, it would be like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and you know, I just wanted to get the basic biographical data down. And then it was really awkward, like um, Tyrus, who was like 100 at the time when I interviewed him, he tried to kiss me, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so I really didn't want to go there <laughs> with 100-year-olds or 80-year-olds, you know what I mean? 
I mean, one thing I can say is that th there is a big difference between interviewing uh, elder family members and interviewing like folks, you know, like in the community, um, because often, oftentimes, when you want to hear a person's full story, they have to trust you, right? So usually, like when you're interviewing your, you know, like your grandparents or your your great aunts or your uncles or people that you might have grown up with, they'll they'll, they'll trust you in a way that they'll be more open with the type of stories they'll tell you. Um, I don't know if that's the juicy parts that you want to hear, but the, they'll definitely be more open in terms of be, giving them a, giving you a more like full breadth of. Uh, of their lives, whereas if it's someone that you're, you know, like Jenny's saying, like people that you know, you really want to interview them, you keep calling them and calling them and calling them, and then they sit down for an interview, they're going to be probably a little bit more closed off than would you know, your, your great uncle. That's a really good question. There's an essay by Deborah Weber that I always refer to when I think about oral history, and she says that oral history is there's two sets of conversations happening. And one conversation is between you as an interviewer and your interview subject, and that relationship fundamentally shapes what is being conveyed, right? This issue of trust, um, the context of that interview. But the other dialogue that's happening is between that person now versus that person in the past, right? And how do they want to remember themselves? Um, what aspects about their lives are they willing to share that they want to convey to you that will, that will explain who they are? And I think it's complicated, right? It's, it's not a straightforward transmission of knowledge just like those documents, those are not, trans, uh, those are not straightforward con transmissions of document um, knowledge. Right? They're created in a particular context. Um, there's inaccuracies in written documents. But there's that aspect when you, when you interview somebody. With Margaret Chung, I was a little bit unsure how my interview subjects would react to me. And so I just would ask them, why do you think she didn't get married? Why do you think she never had children? And just see where that conversation took me. Where did they feel comfortable taking that conversation? Um, this is an issue that's really relevant for my students. I teach at UC Irvine, and we have the largest Vietnamese American population in the, in the world outside of Vietnam. A lot of our, our students are children of refugees, and it's very hard for them to converse with their parents and their grandparents about trauma. Right? And um, this is something that we want to embark on now. We just, I just finished writing a grant. If anybody's from the California Historical Society, um, California Humanities Grant uh, Society, fund us. <laughs> um, but we want to train Cambodian and Pacific Islander youth to interview their elders and talk about their experiences of migration, the challenges of health, but also the foods that they associate with self-care and community care. Um, and we want to emphasize these strategies of resilience. So I'm thinking about Eddie's photos, right? Music, popular culture. It's not just all a story of oppression, right? These are stories of people engaging in life. But it can be hard to have those intergenerational dialogue, even within your family. Um, my father is in his late 80s, and there's, the ling there's a linguist, language um, gap, and there's just all sorts of issues that are, are embedded in, the, in those conversations. So we've tried to budget for translators. We've also tried to budget for cultural facilitators, right? Someone can be there to help kind of guide those conversations. But I, I think it is a very difficult set of conversations to engage in. I think one of the factors is that for my parents' generation, they kept a lot of secrets because we were illegal. You know, they were trying to protect us. They, they didn't, I, I never really found out my father's true name, you know, for one. I, mean, I had several false names, but, uh, he didn't want to tell us because he did. He feared to the day he died that we would all be deported, and so that constraint. I mean, that constraint, along with things like trauma and, and other cases, are, are factors that really limit it. I mean, you can sometimes talk to people and ask them uh, to do it confidentially, and and you can actually do an oral history, make an agreement where you do not release the the story until they've passed or until a certain amount of time. So there are ways to get around some of that. Yeah, that, that, that's a pretty important point. Cause I, I was just thinking of this um, this book that's going to be coming out that's written by uh, Faye Mayan Ng about her dad's life. I think she called it uh, uh, Orphan Bachelors. And uh, <clears throat> just reading uh, the introductory chapter, she, she had this one comment I thought was uh, pretty insightful. She was um, talking about how it takes five generations uh, uh, to deal with for a family to deal with alcohol, alcoholism, but, but as far as the damage of the uh, Chinese exclusion laws, it takes about 10 generations, you know, because of the trauma that it instills, you know, and the fear, the fear of immigration coming to the home, uh, people's false names, and um, just being afraid. Uh, maybe the fears are unfounded, but it's still there, right? Okay. Um, 
Okay, so we have time for what? One or two more questions? How about back there? Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you all for coming here today. So I have two questions. Um, my first one is, as a young person, as a, and things are always happening in the world, um, I find it really difficult to keep up with everything all at once. And um, I'm getting shaky because of all the knowledge that you just imparted on us. Um, so where do we start looking for answers or context of photographs when all you have is the name of an artist? Um, and my second question is, how to digest current events, which will eventually become history, as well as crucial past events, because that's what influences um, what is happening today. <laughs> um, I'll say two things. One is that the visual was incredibly powerful. So when I started doing my dissertation research, I actually had a completely different topic, but I went to the UC Berkeley Ethnic Studies Library and discovered this amazing person. She had written an autobiography, she had correspondence, all these different things. But when I started seeing images of her, that was just so evocative. So that series of images of her being a Victorian lady versus someone who's driving behind the wheel, or someone who's donning, donning on ermine versus someone who's wearing um, a Red Cross uniform, right? It evokes all these questions to me. The visual evokes all these questions to me about self-presentation and what this person was trying to convey about her identity. So I hope that you'll be able to get access to some of these visuals of, the, of this artist that you seems to be interested in exploring. Like, what, what, what do they want to capture? What do they want to convey to the world? And I think those, those visual representations are so powerful. In terms of how to get a handle on what's happening now, um, I tend to watch a lot of Stephen Colbert. <laughs> but I've never been interested in doing a history of the whole, right? And some of, one of my colleagues who studies elite white men in politics, <laughs> he's like, oh, you're really interested in the margins. I'm like, yes, I am very interested in the margins. Right? I take a particular th strand of history, so in this case, I'm following a particular person. And I use her life to think about, well, what's changed from the late 19th through the middle of the 20th century? Right? What's changed religiously? What's changed in terms of gender? What's changed in terms of, of, of race? What's changed in terms of world politics? So I use her eyes to help me understand the larger whole. And that's my particular strategy of, of how to manage um, the kind of complexities of what we're living in now, but also the complexities of the past. In terms of your second question, um, I think what was really helpful for me was learning the basic chronology. Um, you probably already know, but just really letting it sink in of how much the Chinese overcame. If, if the government is prohibiting your right to have citizenship, own land, get married, um, if they are taxing, you know, policing taxes on your line of work, you know, laundry tax, minors, minors tax. If the media is portraying you like an animal, if they're um, making fun of your appearance and your ethnic heritage, and everything is literally against you and your right to exist, and the population of women is reduced on purpose by the government because they don't want you to have a family. A lot of those men, you know, died in bachelor societies, single. Um, I didn't get a chance to point out the photographer, Harry Quillen, who uh, photographed Chinatown. He, you know, didn't have children either, and he kind of found a community in Chinatown. And it's kind of ironic that, you know, those experiences are so relevant today, but if you think of it in context, like the Chinese would, you know, this year's the 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad, and they expect 15,000 people to come, go to Utah on May 10th. If you guys want a road trip, it's going to be really fun. Okay, <laughs> Corky Lee is going to be taking the group photo. Corky Lee, the photographer, you know Patricia, and um, you got to pay $600, but we'll hook you up. Uh, but um, finally, the Chinese are really going to be recognized this year. The, you know, they messed up the 50th anniversary. You know, they didn't include Chinese in the 50th photo. They didn't include it in the, you know, ribbon cutting photo. You know what I mean? We just get like slighted over and over and over again. But then this year,
There was one good thing that happened in this administration this year. It was the passage of the Congressional Gold Medal honoring World War II veterans. The House approved it. The Senate approved it. It went to you know who's signature, and he signed it. So they finally got recognition this year, and it's a huge, huge honor for the, the veterans who were fighting for um, not just Chinese, but Japanese who were fighting while the exclusion law was still on the books, while they were in internment camps. So I, you're kind of silhouetted. I can't tell if you're Asian, but I'm sorry. But if you are, like, just when, when, we, when we did this deep dive into this history, it was just like, you know, it was just, they lifted us up, and, you know, we're going to lift the next generations up. And you kind of feel this unbelievable pride that you, it's like, it was like when my mom told me I was, she was proud of me for the first time when I was 28. It was like the sun came out and shone on my face. And I was like, this is what that feels like. You know, I couldn't even, I couldn't even, I just felt like, my God, my spirit lifted up. So I hope, I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope that helps. I have kind of a good news, bad news answer for you. Uh, on, on the research part, I mean, if you, if you have a name of an artist, you can like find contemporaries maybe. And it's all, research, I find it fascinating. It's just a lot of fun. It's like being a detective. And so when I saw the Broken Blossoms case, I knew the, the slave owners belonged to Tongs, right? I didn't know, I mean, there's a really a good side and a bad side to Tongs, actually. They were formed for self-protection of the community. But there, in other cases, half the members were gangsters. But, so you just look and look and look, and I, I found a news article about my slave owner guy, Wang Sitok, getting arrested in Oakland for planning a, a raid or something. He, he never got to trial on that charge, but he's in the official record. So sometimes you get lucky and you find things through just lots of research. The bad news part is really the second question, and that is like, we, and I hate to say this, but we're living at a time which is unlike any time in human history where, you know, it's a bummer, but um, we're fucking killing the planet. You know, climate change is so real. I mean, we see it now every day, and you know, like all the polls are showing, people are finally getting it, but our politicians don't get it, and the clock is running. And so, I don't want to scare you to death, but like, this is the time where everybody has to like throw down. This is a time where we have to stand up and do things. And many people here, I know you, you're doing things, you're marching, you're writing letters, you're getting angry, you're yelling at the TV, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> it's therapeutic, believe me. But it's, you know, we have to reach down to the next generation, to like our kids and their kids, because we are literally fighting for the fate of the planet. So I guess the good news is that we can still fight. The bad news is that we're really running out of time. I just want to say one more thing, which is that you don't have to do it all. Right? I, I love the fact that people are doing such amazing work, and I don't even know everybody in the audience, and I'm sure you are doing that as well. And so don't feel like you have to take on the fight by yourself, that you can do it with other people. It, it looks like we're out of time here, though. OK. So, <laughs> uh, so let's, let's give everybody a hand. And, um, Great job, panel, and uh, great questions from the audience. Uh, this is only a start. Uh, let's have more conversations. Okay. Yes, let's have more conversations here. You can do it right now with the speakers who are here today. Uh, I'll add all the videos and things that we had tonight. Speakers, please send me things so I can add them to the Facebook page as well. You have surveys. Complete the surveys. There's a little wooden box by the front desk that you can put them in. If you have plates and cups underneath your chairs, pick those up and take them to a garbage can or a recycling bin. Um, and have a good night. You're all wonderful. Thanks to all the speakers. <laughs>